Well, let's just start with a word of prayer. Lord, most holy Father in heaven, we just want to thank you so much for a, a nice summer day, even though it was way hot. We just ask that you come be with us today and uh, give us the right perspective and uh, the imagination that we need to follow your words and your thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'd like to start, I, where it starts for me, in Proverbs 27, 12. Proverbs 27, 12 says, the prudent man sees trouble coming afar off and hides himself from it, but the fool goes on and is punished. And I think, I think that's inspired text for all of time. It's even more so today, I mean, you just look around you, everybody, is living in a state of apprehension. It's just out there and it's pervading um, kind of all levels of society. I, I, sometime back I, I got a catalog and it was, oh, what kind of, I don't know how to describe the catalog. It's all kind of sporting goods store uh, stuff, packs and just all kinds of that kind of stuff. And I, I noticed the headline was kind of a kind of a tagline on the on the front of the catalog. It said famines, disasters, wars, all of biblical proportion. And I thought that's intriguing. Coming from a completely secular point of view, I mean it's just out there and it's everywhere. And yet we see in Proverbs that we're given that advice to, to know how to look forward and recognize uh, things are shaping up. Maybe we want to put ourselves in a different position than we're in right now. Um, I was reminded earlier today as I was listening to, uh, actually I was listening to The Testing Time by Paul Harvey. Write that down and look it up on YouTube and listen to it a dozen times. It's, it's very, very good, and it, it applies to what we're going to be talking about today, The Testing Time by Paul Harvey. What he reminded me was, in the last 3,500 years, only 8% of that time has there been no wars. 8% in 3,500 years. Has there been no official wars going on? And of course, that's official, you know, full-blown wars. D during most of that 8%, though, you can bet that there's a lot of Cold War stuff going on. Nations, you know, just kind of tensing their muscles. And it's something to think about, you know, as, as you read the Old Testament, the first time we really hear about, who was it, Gideon? Do you know what he was doing? He was threshing wheat, but where was he threshing the wheat? He was down inside the wine press, threshing wheat, because the Amalekites were coming across the land and marauding everything they could get their hands onto, stealing things. And he had taken his grain down into the, uh, the wine press because at that time of the season, nobody was using their wine presses. So it was in an out-of-the-way, obscure place that nobody was thinking to look. So that's where he took his grain, and he was quietly threshing his grain there. So, you know, it's like, well, that's a smart idea. And I think it's, it's uh, something that we can think about. I think more than ever before, it's a time to really spread the gospel, but it's also time to think about well, why is it that country life is important for us to consider today? Um, one of the first things that comes up is this idea that centers of population are going to be more and more in turmoil and agitation, but they're going to be also in more and more targeted by you know crazy people out there. And we see that almost every day on the news. And other than that, 
you know, we see crazy stuff like, oh, how do, how do I bring this up? Just aberrant lifestyle is getting so intense that if you don't go along with it, you become a target as well. I mean, look at the, you know, the whole issue of the bakeries that get shut down. The, the, if you don't follow their intensity of wickedness, you become noticed. So, you know, and that's, that's strange. It's just, but it's something that's becoming a common thing that we have to deal with today. On one hand, in Proverbs 27, 12, God is telling us, he's warning us to get out of the way before trouble comes. And typically, that's the primary motivation for a lot of people to consider country living. But I would like to say there's something maybe even more important to consider. In today's society, we live kind of in a tangled web of dependency, kind of supply and demand. If you look back at uh, what happened with Katrina and the whole supply and demand thing com fell completely apart. If you look at some of the riots we've had over the last two decades in Texas, in California, in Seattle, when things go crazy, that intricate web of dependency, is it falls apart quite easily. And so, hmm, that's something to think about. But as we, as we look back in history of our nation, we think what built America was something completely different than what America is made of today. Um, and I think it's best summed up, and I would really encourage you to find this little book by Eric Sloan. Uh, we found it years ago when our kids were going through homeschooling and it was something that we read quite often to them. It's called The Spirits of 76. And I think it really gets to the heart of why we should consider country living. I mean, it's one thing to live in the country to avoid something bad that's harmful. But, it's, but the other half of that is missing and, and that is, as this book points out, what built America as, as it, uh, it develops, is number one, the spirit of hard work. Our pioneers, our forefathers, were not afraid of difficult tasks. And they looked at hard work as a blessing from God. To be able to roll up your sleeves and carve a, you know, a, a living out of the wilderness. Uh, the spirit of frugality it's interesting that he brings this up. When we hear frugality, we think of what? Hoarder, miserly. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about pers purposeful life and the things that you own, not being wasteful. A spirit of pioneering, not being afraid of risk and adventure. You know, I've talked to people about country living and it, it kind of worries them the thought of moving eight, ten miles away out in the country. But the majority of the people that built this country moved from where to where? The edge of civilization out to who knows where. You know, realize what they faced when they got in that covered wagon. And they realized we're going into hostile territory. But we hear it's a good life out there. I mean, what did they have to go by? Did, did they have hard, cold facts that when they got to wherever they was going, it would be a successful life for them? No, it was a gamble. But so much today, we're, we're cocooned in, in so much safety that I think we've lost that spirit of adventure and you know, the, the ability to just, you know what, let's do it. I think we can do it. Let's go. Um, and it goes on, the spirit of agronomy, knowing how to provide for yourself and your family from the land that you're, you're going to work. And I think it's those virtues that are really important for us to develop so that we, in the process, we can improve our characters, we can improve our sense of appreciation for what we have, 
And, you know, one of the most exciting things is to be able to go out when things start ripening and, and, and pick the fruit. Right now, our strawberries and our raspberries are all going strong. Every day, you can just go out and just pick fresh raspberries, fresh um, strawberries. The, the blueberries are all getting ready. I mean, it'd probably be about another month or so before they start ripening. The blackberries are all in bloom. It's going to be two months before they start blooming. But it's like, you look at this stuff, and it's a harvest that's developing. And for me, it gets me excited. You know, and as fall starts coming on, I know the squash will be getting ready, the potatoes. Uh, as I start see, uh, first part of September, I start looking at the weather. How's the weather coming in? Because I'm, I really enjoy going out into the mountains and picking the wild mushrooms, the chanterelles. Um, and if we get a good solid rain of three or four days in early September, they will start producing in September around this area. So I'm watching that because this is just a lot of fun to go out there and just start picking mushrooms. It's just really exciting to be able to provide for your family these things and to just go out and just hunt the forest. And I guess, I guess I'm a hunter-gatherer at, at heart. It's like I want to get out there in the woods and find this kind of stuff. You know, and it's just reclaiming a, a noble independence that I think is really exciting. But, but let's get on to the, the practical side of things. I, I just jotted down some notes, and, you know, maybe we can have some good conversation here, throw some ideas around. But I just wanted to hit some basics, um, considerations for country living, some practical things to think about as maybe you ponder this idea of country living. Maybe, what, maybe you're living in the country, what can you add to your situation so that you're in a good setup to build on where you're at and what you're doing. So I'll start with the question, what do you need to live? What? Okay, water. Is there anything more important than water? Air, right. When I teach a survival class, there's a rule that we use, and it's called the rule of threes. It's just a general rule to kind of prove a point. It's not hard and fast science. But the rule of three says you can basically live three minutes without air. Three hours without shelter, three days without water, and three weeks without food, basically, okay? It's not hard and fast, but it, it gives you an order of priorities. So air is the first one. What's the second one? T. Shelter, third water, and finally, food. The average American can live quite well without food for quite a while. Um, but you think, oh, okay, air, country living, why do I need to consider air? Air is easy to get. It's free. It's all, it's, it's here. We're breathing it, right? But is there a consideration we need to think about when it comes to country living? Um, air can be a big issue if you're downwind from a big city, a big industrial area, um, it may not be a, a really big issue now, but let's say in the mayhem of war and madness that could be coming to anywhere really on this planet, if you get a, if you get a huge DuPont factory that's bombed, what kind of fallout is gonna be coming from that? So as you're kind of looking around and deciding where you wanna put yourself, Kind of think about the weather patterns, the air currents. How do they move around here? Up here, I think we're pretty good as far as the big city of Portland. Yeah? Okay, the eruption. Where did it go? It went east. 
How much, uh, uh, how much asphalt did Yakima get? It wasn't too big, but I think it was like, yeah, I mean, it was that much ash, and it didn't melt like snow and go away. That was a lot of ash. Now, that's kind of hard to predict, but it's something to think about. You know what I'm saying? It's thinking is free, so you might as well do it. It is, because we've seen what happens. So, so when it comes to air quality, think about typically in the morning, air currents will generally go inland and uphill. In the evening, you'll find, if you pay attention, that air currents generally go downhill and down the valley. So think about that in, in how you place yourself. Also, if you're, let's say, scoping out a piece of property, on and around that property, watch the vegetation, especially things like fields of grass, because those, those weeds, those grasses, will grow in the direction of the prevailing winds. And so you'll get, you'll notice the whole field growing over in one direction. And that's because the prevailing weather pushes on it as it grows throughout the season. Notice those things. So you can kind of see how things move through the land. Um, toxic fallout, radioactive fallout. You know, chances are that's not going to be a big deal here in the large metropolis of Castle Rock. But in Portland, where's the air currents going around Portland? They're going up the gorge and then they're going down the gorge. So that's, that's, you know, just a heavy air current flow through there. So while the gorge might be a really pretty place to go, there's a lot of restrictions, uh, land restrictions. So that's kind of a downer. But anything that happens in Portland is going to be blown up the gorge or down the gorge. So that's something to think about. Another thing to think about is, okay, so we're going to go out, we're going to find a place in the country might be away from the city, but if you've got a large agricultural farm right next to you that's doing spraying, that can be a big issue. We saw that happen at Country Haven Academy years ago when we were teaching uh, at the school over in Tri-Cities. There would be the, the dusting planes would fly through, you know, or the big tractors. And there was one point that uh, there was a tractor out there and it had like a 48-foot boom spraying whatever it was it was probably a fungicide on a breezy day and the breeze was just going right across campus and we had a whole building full of students doing transplanting right next to the fence and this fog was just coming in flowing through the building you know so I had to run out there and tell the guys you know hey you need to stop what you're doing and he did you know because that's that's a legal issue you got to really pay attention to weather but he just figured well you know I got to get this done and, and so he was doing it but uh, you know that's something to think about too putting yourself uphill or downhill from a commercial farm my in-laws live right across the street up in on Alaska from a chicken farm and I don't know if you've been around the chicken farms but in the evening it always was a very very bad smell and it wasn't a pleasant place to live Fortunately, it shut down a couple years into their living there, so it's not a problem now. But, you know, living across the street from one of these big factory farms is just not a fun place. So those are some things to consider when it comes to air quality and uh, where you want to put yourself. As far as shelter goes, there's a couple of big issues when it comes to country living and shelter. Uh, One of them is location, obviously, and the other one's heating and cooling. When it comes to location, yeah, this kind of goes back to the idea of the mountain. Um, if you've looked at the, the news articles and the reports of geology, the speculation is the next mountain to go is which one? Rainier. So knowing that, 
Are you going to want to put yourself on or near any tributary to the Rainier Mountain? Okay. What's the... Okay, how about us? Um, are we near any tributaries to Rainier? Cowlitz River. Yeah, not only gets fed by Mount St. Helens through the Toodle, but the Cowlitz River comes from Mount Rainier, the south side of it. It does too, doesn't it? Where does the Cispus come into? Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, again, something to think about is you've got the mountains. Um, what about fire? Fire dangers. Where we live, I know some of you have been out, out to where we, where, we, uh, where we live. And oftentimes I think about fire danger. Um, I think we're okay on a couple of fronts. Th most of our land um, in front of our house, which is downhill, is cleared quite a ways away from our house. If we have a forest fire, chances are, if it's going to threaten us, it's probably going to be coming from downhill. Maybe that gets started down on West Side Highway and it's going to come up the hill very fast. There's a large buffer between us and the nearest forest, and especially now since they logged. So we're pretty good. The other thing to think about as well is how many ways in and out do you have on your proposed location? If you just have one way in and one way out, that's a bad deal. I've got a friend of mine that uh, lives kind of on a dead-end street, one way in, one way out, and the road drops steep down into a creek valley and then comes up. That would be so easy in a really bad ice storm to be inaccessible to go through that section. Also, if it gets plugged up, by flood water, the road could wash out and then you're stuck. No way in, no way out. So then what if we get the big earthquake? You know, then things get really bad. If you're needing medical help, fire, your house is on fire, and there's no way in, no way out, you're stuck. And it's, so that's something to think about. You should always kind of have a back way out um, for a vehicle. If nothing else, a four-wheel drive. So, you know, think about how many ways in, how many ways out do you have? Uh, floods, winds, how about slides? How many of you have seen the pictures of the Oso slide? How many, uh, how many houses did that take out, by the way? Wow, that, w that was an abnormally huge, huge slide. Um, I don't know how many of you have been up Kalama River since last, no, two winters ago. Um, but just not very far up Kalama River, there's a house that was down by the river. And I don't know if you've been up Kalama River Valley, but it's a very steep canyon. There was a little ravine coming down the canyon, and that mountain is pretty much made of rock. But all of the, the dirt setting on the rock in this little ravine came loose, and it all came down, crossed the road, and just smashed over the house that was right just happened to be in a very wrong place. Who'd have thought of it 30 years ago when they built the house? You know, hasn't happened yet, right? So what's the chance of it happening now? Well, you know, it's something to just to think about and be aware of. Slides. Um, another situation, I was invited by a friend to go look at some prospective property uh, a couple years ago. And it was, I think, east of... Centralia. And just driving up there, it was a nice country road, but driving up where there, all the houses on the way to this property, how do I say this? They all had kind of vehicles out front, up on blocks. They all had a lot of, it just looked like a really shady place going up there. It, it didn't look like happy, fun, friendly neighbors. It just looked like a meth valley is what it looked like. It might be a really good 
piece of property, but if things get tough, what kind of neighbors? Now, that's unpredictable, right? Even the nicest people get testy when things get hard and, and it's life or death. So, you know, we can't, we just can't predict everything and it's not the point to, but it's just, let's consider at least what we can about what's going on around us. So those are kind of some things to think about. Uh, country living, if you don't have electricity, electricity tends to go out more often out in the country than it does in the city sometimes. How are you going to heat? How are you going to cool? That's a, uh, some considerations to do. Um, how are you going to cook? Is there firewood on the property? If not, well, then that means you're going to have an umbilical cord out to somebody who does have firewood. But let's kind of get into that. You want to look at if there's an established house on, on a proposed country property, you want to look at it how are we going to heat it? How are we going to cool it if we don't have electricity? Right. Typically, firewood and, and uh, fireplace is the best way to do that. It's been around forever. Um, and we'll come back to that. But I've had people tell me, well, you know, I'm too old for all this stuff. I can't cut firewood. It's just too much work. And I asked them the question, okay, so is it too much work to be in town with the gangs when things go crazy and you don't have any electricity and you don't have any heat anyway? You know what I'm saying? Would you rather be in where it's crazy or would you rather be out where it's maybe less crazy and you have to work a little? And you know what? It's going to burn some calories, right? It's going to tone you up. And that's good for your health. And when is it that losing some weight, becoming more trim is ever a bad thing? You know what I mean? It goes back to this, the spirit of hard work and knowing I can do it. You know what? And it's good for me. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself and forget something here. But something else to think about is this. This really struck me when I, when I came across this idea. Typically we see this and we think, ah, yes, firewood, right? Um, this is firewood that came from a big fir tree, but this is just the branches. Now these are pretty big branches. You, you'd probably stop and cut this up. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize is that branch wood, well, let me back up. BTUs, which is a term we call a British thermal unit, it's a unit that we measure heat content, typically in wood and in other heating and cooling systems. The BTUs in firewood are a function of the wood's density. So it stand to reason that oak would have a lot more BTUs in it than, say, Douglas fir, right? because oak weighs a lot more than Douglas fir. But think about this. Your average fir tree that has a limb, let's say, coming out of it, that limb has the same number of rings as the tree does at that point, which means the limb is a lot more dense than the trunk would. So many people are just busy trimming off the limbs to get to that big chunk of firewood that they're going to have to cut up into big rounds and then what? Haul it home, split it. You know, it's just the manhandling of this piece of this tree right here was, that's the core. So it was that big around. And then you've got to pick this stuff up, put it on this log splitter or, you know, do it by hand. There's a lot more work going into this then all I did with this was cut, cut, and it's done. This is more dense than this. And if we look at it, how about the volume? Which one's, which one's more volume? This one, right? 
these weigh about the same. They both have a, approximately the same BTUs. Which one was easier to cut and handle? It's the branch wood. Okay. This, the density of branch wood is almost equivalent to oak. And yet so many people just kind of poo-poo this as gets in the way. Um, if, it's, if it's over two inches, it's really, really good wood. And the thing to think about it in terms of, of cord wood, you've got your standard cord which is four foot by four foot by eight foot, right? If you're cutting branch wood, to get the same number of BTUs, might be only that much, two feet or three foot. You see, equivalent, equivalency. See what I'm saying? And especially if we're getting a little bit older, it's a little bit harder to manhandle big stuff. Go for the thing that nobody else is really thinking about. Cut up all the branches. Your wood pile is going to be smaller, but it's going to have the same BTUs as all this nicely big, chopped, stacked, split stuff. It's less work but you get the same bang out of it. Why? Dense, more, you can pack more in. And the other thing, yeah, it's not split. So the, the, the burn has to go through layer by layer, whereas burning this, it, it just burns right through. It burns hot, but think about this. this I did some calculations. This piece of wood, well, and this one are about the same weight. It's about four pounds. Each one of these has about 34,000 BTUs in it, right there. So there's almost 100,000 BTUs. Actually, there's more. There's over 100,000 BTUs right there. Now, if you, could, if you could turn that all into heat energy, that would heat, uh, let's see, uh, uh, let's say 120,000 BTUs. That would heat, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's kind of about what I'm thinking. For several hours if you could extract all the heat. Now, you're going to lose some heat up a chimney. Um, but different efficiencies of stoves can help that. There's a really neat uh, stove design called the rocket mass heater in which, I, I don't have time to go into it, but it's fascinating if you look it up, rocket mass heaters. They take small diameter of wood, burn it almost to complete combustion and then the, the chimney, instead of going up out the top of the house, goes through um, kind of some curves that is, is in the middle of a large thermal mass or, you know, a cob or brick or mortar. It heats up that large mass, and by the time the, uh, I was going to say the smoke comes out, which is not smoke anymore because it's a complete combustion. So what comes out of the chimney is... Uh, CO2 and water vapor and it comes out fairly cool so you've extracted almost all the energy out of that wood a little bit of wood heat up that thermal mass and that thermal mass just radiates heat all day long so there's lots of um, lots of things that you can do when it comes to heating As far as if you have to buy wood or, well, if you have to cut it, uh, we cut wood every fall. Our house is terribly inefficient. It's just, it's horrible. Um, the insulation in the outside walls of our house is R3. It's one inch thick fiberglass. 
It's horrible. So I go through about eight or nine cord of wood, yeah, in a year. But it keeps me young, right? That's a lot of energy. And so our woodshed, is, our woodshed holds about 18 cords. And what I've done is I've put two doors in the woodshed. So this year I used up this wood. Next winter I will use this wood. This year, I will fill this empty spot. So I'm doing this kind of back and forth thing, rota rotating. So hopefully we've always, well, right now we have one year's supply of wood. If, if I were to fall off a, a ladder and lose both my legs for some reason, Jeannie would have a year's supply of wood. But once I get the, the wood, the, the shed fill, Field. We, for the most part, we have two years supply of wood on hand. You know, and that, I think that's good. Um, if you keep it dry, how long does firewood last? It's forever. You know, it's something that you can just squirrel away for for hard times. Um, how about cooling? Uh, that's something that we're thinking of today. How, how do you cool a house? Well, something to think about is, okay, where's the windows? When the, when the heat is coming in like it has been today, you know, can you, can you shade those windows? In our house, we have a couple of skylights that act like greenhouses, and our trailer just gets like an oven. So in the summertime, I'll go up and put white sheets over our skylights. That really helps. We have a little tiny skylight that's about 12 by 12 inches in the middle of our hall. And I discovered that just opening that skylight, as small as it is, really has an effect on cooling our house. Because again, you're, the, the house is all hot, but where is it the hottest? Is that by the ceiling, right? Well, if you can just siphon that ceiling air off and out the out that vent, um, that little tiny skylight, that has a, a, a big effect on cooling the house. So I can pop that open. I can shade my, uh, uh, what, did, what were they, were? Um, uh, sunlights, um, skylights, excuse me. And, and, you know, and then shade the front, front windows. I can keep the house cool. So, you know, look at, Look at your building. Can we cool it reasonably without electricity? Uh, another thing that you can do as well is plant deciduous trees on the south-facing side of your house. Deciduous trees, the ones that lose their leaves in the winter, if you've got those on the south side of your house, they're going to shade your house in the summer, right? In the fall, in the winter, they're going to lose their leaves so you're going to still be able to get the sunlight to warm your house in the winter. So you kind of, you know, kill two birds with one stone um, by, by deciduous trees. You don't get that with fir trees. If you plant a row of fir trees, then you're stuck with permanent shade. So that's a consideration, heating and cooling. Another thing to consider... Country living oftentimes puts you beyond immediate emergency help. So it's really important, I think, very smart to have. Now this, it would be too small for a home fire extinguisher. If it's okay if you have one in the kitchen, but get the bigger ones. I mean, they're 50 bucks or something, to, uh, a, a five pound or a seven-pound fire extinguisher. It's just a really good thing to have. If the fire department is 15, 20 minutes out, fire can go a long ways in 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I keep this fire extinguisher in my truck. And I don't know how many of you have come upon a, a car on the side of the road that's just starting to burn. I've seen three cars burn, and they're just starting to burn, and you can't do a thing about it. It's 
just, it's a little fire, but you can't get in there and stop it. And so you just, what do you do? You just feel so helpless and you watch the whole thing in 15 minutes. The whole car is just completely engulfed. When, if you'd had one of these, just put it out right there. Um, you know, I think we paid 30 bucks for a two pack of these. I mean, that's cheap insurance, isn't it? Um, and the same thing with medical supplies. Um, this is kind of a basic first aid. I also keep that in my, uh, in my truck. But it's intelligent to think about these emergency things that now being out away from these services, you've got to depend a little bit more on you being your first responder. Do you know something about how to deal with medical emergencies? Um, if you don't, you should learn. This kind of came home to me, well, several different times. Um, one of them was when I was doing some chainsaw work. And of course, when you're operating the chainsaw up here, they tell you not to do that, but you know, sometimes you gotta do it. Well, I was working on some vine maple cutting up here like this, and it came through and I came down and I put little nick marks all the way down my leg. <laughs> and it's like, wow. My guardian angel had to have stopped that chain just at the right spot because that just came down. Uh, you know, and I've taken little nicks out of the end of my shoe. You think about, wow. Um, I was out cutting firewood and I was walking up this log that was at a steep angle. I got halfway up there and I could feel myself slipping. The, uh, the bark will sometimes rot a little bit and, and it's just like ice skating on this log. I was probably seven feet off the ground and I could feel myself going, and it's just like throw, and the saw was running. So I felt myself going, so it's pitch the saw as far as you can away from where you're gonna go and go off the other way and then just thank the Almighty that he had mercy on you. Another time that really kind of helped me realize this is more important than even me was when my kids were a little bit younger, I sent them down into the woods because they were old enough to know how to operate chainsaws safely. They were old enough to l run our tractor and the winch that we would use to pull in wood. They knew how to do it. I had gone over it many, many times. They had done it. They knew the safety issues. So I'm like, okay, today I want you guys to do it by yourself. That's good. That's the next step in their learning. So we walked down there. I said, I want you to get that log. And Jesse, I want you to pull that log in. I want Jess, Daniel, you to pull that one in. Yard it up to the tractor, uh, choke it onto the tractor, and then pull it up, and I'll be up at the woodshed waiting for you. So Jeannie and I were just kind of doing nothing, waiting for them to get up, and they don't come up, and they don't come up, and they don't come up. And it's like, are those kids fooling around again? Well, so then we're like, okay, maybe we should walk down there. And just about that time, here Jesse comes walk, running. He just full run up the road, out of the woods, and he's just out of breath. He's like, Daniel, Daniel. Okay, what does that do to you as a parent? <laughs> he's like, it's, it's Daniel. And it's like, oh, man. And he's so out of breath. And we're like, okay, what about Daniel? What's, what's going on? What's, what's happening? And he's so out of breath, he can't talk. You know, and we're just going crazy about now. And so Jeannie runs, grabs the truck in case we have to transport. I run with Jesse, and as we're running down, I'm asking, what, what a, I want to know what I'm going to see because I want to be ready from, a, you know, the, the first responder medical perspective so I can go right to work at whatever is going on. I want to be formulating a plan while I'm getting there. But he's so out of breath. All he can say is, well, he's not under the tractor or anything like that. It's like, well, okay, well, is he missing a leg? You know, what? 
So we got down there into the woods and Daniel's, he's crouched in the middle of the, the road and he's holding his leg. It's like, whew, okay, he's alive and he's upright. Okay, things are gonna be fine. So what happened? Jesse's pulling his log in and it hits something, at, you know, a buried something or other rock or whatever and it jams. And so he's still trying to yard it in but as he does it, it brings the tractor up off its front wheels. So he releases the choke, drops the tractor back down. And bless him, he thinks, Daniel, counterweight. Get in the bucket. Okay, this is a 2,400-pound tractor. Daniel, 97-pound Daniel, get in the bucket and kind of counterweight. And so then he did it again and pulled the tractor up. And then... When it come up, he let the choke go, or the clutch go, and it dropped the tractor back down. Well, Daniel lost his footing, and he hit his shin right there on the, on the sharp edge of the tractor bucket. And, of course, it just cut it right down to the bone. And so he's really bleeding, and it's like, oh, okay. Did you guys learn anything? Yeah. D Daniel, get in the tractor bucket. No, he doesn't do that anymore. So he did learn. But we got him up to the house and cleaned it off and got some good video of moving this open thing around so we could see his blood veins and his shin bones and, you know, his guy stuff. And then we patched him all back together and things were fine. But I realized country living, it's imperative that you know and understand how to deal with medical emergencies and fire because you are the first responder. So those are some things to think about. Okay, let's go on. Um, water, that's, that's the next thing to think about. Water really is life. Technically, the only legal way to get water in this state is a well. But we have a spring because we built, we developed the spring back in the 70s when you could do that. Um, it's, it's, sometimes it's just really impractical to do a well. It's very expensive to do a well, but there's some pros and cons with a well versus a spring. Can you think of any? What? Right. If your water is 100 feet down a hole this big around, how are you going to get it? Okay, that's a con. You've got to have some sort of a hand pump, which is doable. Surface water is very easily ac accessed in an emergency. I mean, it's right there. But the bad part about surface water is pollution. It contaminates easy. And not contaminant as in nuclear waste, although who knows, or you know, um, animals and runoff um, is something to think about. So it might be more accessible, but it's also, it's gonna have bacteria in it. It's just, it will have bacteria. Now our spring at our house, it, it has an enormous amount of um, bacteria in it. I've taken it to the lab and tested it, but it's stuff, it's bacteria and it's stuff that's indigenous to the Pacific Northwest. And when you drink it all the time, day in, day out, you develop a nice friendly relationship with this bacteria. Um, and it's okay. Now, if somebody from Boston comes out and stays for a day, it might upset their stomach a little bit. But we're all used to it because we're exposed to those things. It's just the same reason when you go to Africa, they tell you to what? Don't drink the water. But everybody over there does. How do they survive it? It's because they're used to it. So you're going to get that. If your health is compromised, you do want to think about those things because you want to minimize those, those risks. So... Having a well is a good thing. And ideally a well, a good well is fairly sterile as far as 
if that water's coming from who knows how far down, it's not going to have bacteria. It's not going to have a lot of crud in it. It might have sediment. Uh, might have some iron in it, but we can deal with things like that. Um, so really the best thing you could do is have a well and put a hand pump on it. There are two companies that produce reasonably good hand pumps. And I'll just jot this down if you want to look them up later. Uh, hand pumps can be expensive on a well, a couple thousand dollars, but it's water. You want to pay $2,000 to live? I'd probably do that. Um, one of them is Bison Pump, and I can't remember it have, if it has an S on it, dot com. So Bison Pump might be pumps. I'm not sure. Uh, and then the other one is simplepump.com. Both of them, I think both of them are stainless steel hand pumps that you can install right on the top of a wellhead. Um, I think you can even use the same pipe that's in your well, maybe. Check up on it. But uh, those are a couple of really good brands that are used a lot by people that uh, do the serious country living thing. Uh, some other considerations. Rainwater in a storage tank. But the crazy thing is, do you realize in some places of the country it's illegal to collect rainwater? To me, that is absolutely nuts. Uh, because water is in short supply. I, th I think maybe, where is it, in California? It's against the law. It's just mind-boggling. Now, okay. <sighs> Tax, yeah. Um, there has been two times in this state that they have tried to tax your wellhead. And basically, it would be putting a little tag on it, just like a tag on your license plate. Um, but I think both times it got rejected soundly. People said, no, you cannot tax something that is a requirement to live. <sighs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's illegal to collect rainwater here, uh, which is a good thing. But, but that's kind of another thing is the more metropolitan of an area you're in, the more of these regulations you're going to have to fight. Um, and some of them are just, wow. Nathan. No, you can't. Yeah. So, now, see, and that's the kind of the thing that you kind of have to weigh out. In order to get a permit, you might have to do this. But then... You know, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I, you know, there's some things I just can't say. But, you, but this thing right here is something I want to talk about. This is a ramjet. It's just the coolest thing. It uses no electricity. But what it does is it has an incoming two-inch fitting right here uh, underneath of it. So you can take a water source that's not very high above this ram, put it down into a two-inch pipe, bring it to the ram, and coming out of the ram is a one-inch pipe. And I think actually we necked that down to three-quarters of an inch, I believe, maybe. 
but this will take a water source that may be, oh, let's just say is 20 feet above the pump, and it will shoot water up without electricity 50, 60, 70 feet above this pump. And it's, what it's doing is it's taking a lot of water, gets it flowing down the pipe, and then this little thing right here snaps shut, creates a pressure in this chamber here, which then forces a little bit of water out this pipe. So the extra water from the two-inch line burps out the top here. So it's using a lot of water to shove a little bit of water higher than the original source. And it just goes and goes and goes and goes. Um, there are friends of mine that were told, telling me about um, looking at some property and they were out in the field and they heard this thump, thump, thump and it sounded like it was coming from under the ground. Well, they started kind of poking around and I believe what it was was like a, it was below the ground and it was a barrel over top of one of these rams that had been down there running for years and years and years. It just bonk. Bonk, bonk. This is the only moving part, really, to it, right there. Yeah, I, you know, it might have been feeding a pond, or I, I, uh, I don't think so. I'm not sure, but I, uh, she's got a spring that's up on a hill. Mm -hmm. it has pressure. Pounds pressure. Um, right. mm -hmm. In New York, that's why they have water barrels or water tanks on top of buildings. Uh, yeah. Because the city can't feed the building. It's too tall. Right. So yeah. they have pumps throughout the building to fill that and everybody's water. And I know that for every foot. It yeah. I, and I can't remember that. Yeah, and so they have to have these booster pumps right. all the way up these huge buildings because the physics of it, it is impossible to pump right. a column of water. So the column of water has to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller till by the time you get to 100 stories, the pipe has to be a you know, half-inch diameter. Well, how do you feed, uh, feed Oh, you know, that section of the building way up there on a half inch, you've got to store it up there and then pump gravity feed it down. And I'm not sure what that, that is, but it's, but it's out there. It's easy to look up. Um, but having one of these, again, no electricity. Electricity gets cut, so what? We still got water. We had this set up years ago. Um, it put water into a 500-gallon tank up on top of the hill behind us, and then we got really nice gravity-feed water down at the house. The problem was that we have a rental house that was only about 20 feet below our water tank, and it didn't give them enough gravity flow, so we stopped using it. And then when I moved on to the excuse me, property 17 years ago, it was just sitting out in the weather, so I disconnected it and I brought it in just so it wouldn't just rot to pieces. So, But someday, you know, I'll get it hooked up again. So, and I should do that sooner than later. Another thing to think about is filtration. Uh, filtra fil filtration versus purification. In filtra uh, filtration, you're typically just removing sediment. And you'll get sediment in a well just as well as you'll get sediment in a spring. Just depends on where you're located. Uh, typically, the, the filters that you see are small for a household system. I think those are too small. Um, they have these filters now that are 20 inches long and about 5 inches around. That's what we have on our system. 
you want a bigger filter if you have maybe a lower pressure, maybe a gravity feed system. A bigger filter feeds more water through it without a loss of pressure. So that's kind of something to think about is, is going with a bigger filter, more water can go through it without dropping that pressure. And then the other thing that you're going to have to think about is purification, especially if you're doing a spring. Uh, you're getting runoff, you can have giardia in there, and that's not very fun to have, if anybody's had it here. Uh, also, purification removes, you know, uh, your water system, Wanda and David, do you guys have a, a system that takes iron or stuff out of the water? Softener, okay. Does that operate without electricity? So when the electricity's down, you don't have any water anyway because it's an electric pump, right? So if you had a hand pump, you'd want to think about, do I need to treat this water? You're not going to get the iron out of it, but you may need to cook it. You what? Okay. Can you put loose, like, pitchered water into? Okay. Like a Brita filter? Okay. But it's something that you can fill and, and you can, okay. And, you know, that might be another option. Uh, spring development, like, again, like I said, you, in theory, can't do this anymore. But how you would develop a spring is take the little mud hole where the water's coming out. You would open that up, dig all the mud out, put a cement casing in there oftentimes, and then f put gravel in. And then that's where your pipe is going in. And then you're going to cover that. So you will get sediment in there, but you're not going to get the mud coming back in around if you do it right. So there's a lot of people that have developed a spring head, put a cover of it, put dirt back over it, and then plant grass, plant ferns, plant the natural. And yeah, it's, it's completely invisible. It's down there. It's providing you fresh, clean water because now the water is not exposed to surface contaminants. It's coming from down. So you minimize your, your outside contamination into it. You know, and years ago, people used to do that all the time. Um, but we need to be saved from ourselves, so we can't do that now. Um, next thing to consider. So air, shelter, water, food. Uh, being able to grow food is is one of the most exciting things I think to know how to do. <laughs> yes, Wanda. Yes, um, might not be fun, but you know it's one of those things. What made America was the ability. You know, great great grandma and grandpa had between them the ability to go out into the wilderness. They knew how to forge, make their tools, to cut down the trees, to use the animals, to pull the stumps, to plow the field. They knew how to do the vet work on their animals. They knew how to deliver their own children. They knew how to be self-sustained, and we've totally lost that. And it really is a good feeling to get back there and to be able to pick your own food, it's just exciting to, to come home with a tractor full of squash. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but to me, that is just one of the best times of year when, when I can be putting this stuff away. It just is a really good feeling to know that it's, we have it, we've, we've done the prep work, and we've put it away. Uh, and this is an issue that a lot of people don't really talk about. And you'll, if you go to seminars on country living, and I might show uh, a little trailer here in a bit. 
We'll see if it works. But uh, one, of the, one of the resources, this sustainable preparedness uh, done by our friends, the Meisners, they did a program here a couple years ago. They live over in Idaho. But the picture they have on their website is a cabin in the mountains by a nice lake and then in the background you see these snow-capped mountains. That is a rotten, rotten place to have a country lifestyle house because there's probably six weeks growing season. Typically, a lot of people, you know, and especially people that are into this country, hey, let's, let's do this, they get the idea, let's move to the mountains. Soil, predominantly, is always terrible in the mountains. Plus, your growing season is about that long, you know, six weeks, maybe. And then you get this much snow, and it's a terrible place. It's a nice place to go visit, but when it comes to actually living and providing what you need, you want to think about what can we grow in this location. So looking at it in terms of what grows there to begin with, um, there's a big difference in this area between being up on the hills and being down in the valley um, where the Whitakers live, um, where Ron and Ruth Davis lived. It's on the flat of the valley. Nice, sandy, just really nice soil to work with. They can, they can get out there and rototill at 10 minutes after a hard rain. And it just, it's like marshmallow fluff. It's beautiful soil. Their season, just right across the river in Castle Rock here, is about two weeks ahead of our season, five miles north. We're up on the hill. Our soil is red clay. And oftentimes, I can't till it till getting into June. You know, so it's like, uh, um, that puts me several weeks behind. Um, but, you know, if you can't help it, if everything else works on this one spot, you can amend that soil. There's not too many soils that are permanently so messed up that they can't be repaired. So getting a soil test, it's cheap, it's easy to do, and there's, there's recommendations that can come with a good soil test to tell you what to put in it. You can get conventional recommendations or you can get organic recommendations. What do I need to do from this soil test to make my garden spot perfect? Okay, and then start working on that. I've been adding compost and a little bit of sand and just a lot of uh, mulch to our soil for years. Uh, all the ash from our wood stove goes out there. And over the years, we've made some really good soil out in our garden that works quite well. Uh, so there's things that you can do to amend that soil. Another thing to do is if you can't find flat ground, if the ground is sloped, try to find the, the slope that's towards the south. <clears throat> A five degree slope facing south is the equivalent growing condition as 300 miles south of that spot. Okay, when it comes to sun exposure, if you can tilt that ground five degrees, you get the same sun intensity as 300 uh, miles to the south. So that's like southern Oregon. If you can get a south, and if you can get a 10% slope, you gather even more light. Uh, I've got a friend that lives on the north side of a mountain and so in the winter, the sun is just like barely over the edge of the, the ridge. It stays cold, long time. This, it just is not a really good growing. It, she can do it, but it's not the best situation to be facing north. Um, so if you can find south-facing slope, that's good. Another thing to watch for is, again, in the morning, Air currents tend to go uphill. In the evening, it tends to go downhill. Look for these low valleys that tend to be frost pockets. First place to get frost in the, in the fall and the last place to get frost, to lose the frost in the spring. 
uh, where Jeannie and I lived over on Country Haven, so, uh, just north of Tri-Cities, was one of those spots. They weren't really paying attention when they built the greenhouse business for the school, and it was just down in the lowest part of campus, and, and then just the first place to get frost. So we were always fighting the cold down in that one spot. Um, try to get up, maybe up on a, on a hill a little bit, so you avoid that cold river of air that flows up and down those valleys. Damp areas. You want to watch for damp areas, and how you do that is watch the vegetation. That kind of means getting to know what vegetation lives around damp areas. Um, uh, water plants, like these, uh, the rushes, the reeds, the cattails, if you see those growing out in the field, you know that's going to be a really wet spot. That may be a problem when it comes to rototilling and and doing tractor work, you might always be getting stuck in that one spot. It might not be good for gardening or an orchard if it's too wet because you just can't get out there and you know be able to plow it consistently. So watching the vegetation. Uh, if you're up, ever up on West Side Highway, just right over the county, the Lewis County line, there's a field on your left. And if you look, most of that field is grass and they keep it mowed and it's and it's workable but the north corner of that field look at the vegetation change the grasses there's a lot of sedges and a lot of really tall grass that's indicative of a marsh and they, they can't work that area that part of the field so knowing what to look for and watching the vegetation um, you don't want to buy a place that the field turns out to be a swamp underneath all that vegetation that you just can't work. So that's something to think about. As far as planting a garden, I think the, the bulk of your garden should be pre preservable foods, not lettuce, summer squash, and stuff like that that really doesn't preserve well. Although you can preserve summer squash, right? You can shred it, you can cut it up, and you can freeze it. But again, when it comes to um, uh, preserving, what's the downside of freezing? Electricity. The upside of freezing is you retain the most nutrients from the original product, but you're dependent on electricity. So you've got to think about it's going to cost you something year-round to keep that food frozen. Where that really came home to me was I was cleaning out a freezer that mom had on the back porch when we moved into the house. And I got to the very back. I found an old Wesson oil gallon jug with raspberry, no, boysenberry juice in it from 1978. And it really got me wondering how much money did we spend keeping that gallon jug frozen for 35 years. You spent enough electricity to buy how many boysenberry flats? You know what I'm saying? I mean, look at it in, in economic sense. We, we probably spent $100 maybe. I don't know what it, what it would be. I, you know, I don't want to work it out. It's too much. But, but the idea is if you're putting something in the freezer, you're paying rent, as it were, to keep it there in its frozen condition. Now, you kind of do the same thing when you put the electricity into it all at once to can it. But once it's canned, it's there. It's good. It takes no more energy input to keep this on the shelf. So, you know, it's kind of a payoff. Electricity can go out, everything can go bad, and I can still have this. But whatever's in my freezer when the power goes out, I either need to not open that freezer if I expect the electricity to come back on, or I need to get into that freezer and empty it as quick as I can and get that stuff preserved some other way before it goes bad. Um, I've got a friend that has, because they really like frozen food, and the nutrition it has, they have five freezers, two refrigerators. If things go bad, 
They do have a generator. But it's a matter of plug this one in for two hours, then plug that one in for two hours, and then, you know, that's a lot of work. And that's a lot of potential loss. I mean, that's five freezers. That's pushing a couple thousand dollars worth of food. Yeah. So then gas. And see, you just set yourself up for a very precarious situation. So, uh, so c coming back to this, the bulk of your garden should be, I think, preservable foods. And the big, there's kind of a big four, and it's potatoes, corn, be beans, peas, the legumes, and squashes. Potatoes and squash um, are things that you'll want to cure. And, you know, and being that I'm at the farmer's market two times a week, you wouldn't believe how many people I talk to that know nothing about curing. Now, there was a time that I didn't know about curing. And so I brought our potatoes in the house on the back porch and all our squashes, and every week I would have to go out, go through all the potatoes, go through all the squashes, and pull out the rotten ones. And what I realized was rot was eating more potatoes than we were. So then I started talking to people, and it's like, oh, yeah, well, don't you cure things? Well, and so that was when I had to learn to cure Potatoes or winter squash, for, let's say winter squash, for example, you leave it out in the field as long as you can. The vine will start dying back when we start getting the rain and the bad weather. And it comes a point in time where you realize, you know what, that vine is no longer contributing to my squash because it's pretty much dead. At that point, break the vine off the stem, leave the stem attached to the squash, and then bring the squash in. We bring it into our house, just kind of across the room from our wood stove, where it's maybe 75, 80 degrees. And we'll, we'll just leave it there in the house for about two weeks, week and a half, two weeks. We'll dig our potatoes about the same time, in late fall. Don't wash the potatoes off. Just kind of clean them off a little bit, you know, the big clods of dirt, so it's just the potato. But they're, you know, they're still a little bit dirty. Put them in shallow boxes. Bring those in also. Um, shallow. shallow boxes. So you don't want this great big old huge box of potatoes. Uh, you want the air to be able to, be able to circulate through it. And again, those are six or eight feet from our wood stove for a couple of weeks. And what happens is it dries down the skin and makes the skin of these things very, very tough. And it seals it in. And then you can either put it in, out on the back porch, in the garage, or in a back room where it's cool and dark. And these things will last all winter long without rotting. You might get a, a, a rot here and there, something to pick out, but it's, it's vastly different. And I don't know if, if any of you remember, a couple of years ago I was doing a thing. I had a pink banana squash several years that I grew. I grew several of them. We cured them, and I kept one for 13 months. That's fabulous. I, to me, that's just, that's just a miracle. That's wow. That's over a year. We, we picked it in September. We cured it, and we kept it until the following October. Just fine. The end of it, about the end four inches was starting to shrivel and go bad. But th the squash is this big. So we just whack off the end and the rest of it was just as good as when we picked it. It was good squash. But learning these little tricks to be able to preserve things, that's where this is one of the coolest books you could ever find. I, it talks about all kinds of preserving um, things. Just an excellent, excellent resource of um, preserving food. Uh, preserving, you can also do fruits. Everybody knows that. You can can, you can dry, you can keep it frozen, but again, there's issues with uh, freezing. Uh, things like carrots, beets, parsnips, those things, you can keep those stored out in the garden where they grew. 
And that's something that's really fun to do is go out in the middle of winter when the weather's bad, maybe there's snow on the ground, kick the snow aside, shovel, dig up some parsnips. And it's like they're there. And the, really, parsnips don't get really good until they've had a hard frost. So if the ground is frozen on top, that's the best time to dig them because that's when they get really sweet. Go out, hey, you know, we want parsnips for lunch. And it's the middle of December or, December or, or January. A shovel full, dig it out, grab your parsnips, go back in the house, wash them up, and you've got fresh produce. That is just really fun to do. You can do the same thing with carrots um, and beets. The other thing you can do with carrots, beets, and parsnips also is harvest them, but put them in boxes of sand in a cellar or in a damp, uh, cool place. Um, we've really kind of lost the, the art of cellaring, knowing how to keep things down in a cellar. I mean, just, they don't build them anymore. Uh, but there's a lot of resources that teach you how to do that. And it's, a, it's incredible, the things that you can keep. Uh, you know, and, and another product of that, people don't store stuff anymore, is the, the variety of fruits that we get has gone way down. If you go back 100, 150 years ago, you could probably find 50 to 100 varieties of apples in America because every variety has its specialty use. There were some apples, and you can still get them today, they're hard to find, but that will keep all winter long down in the cellar. Pears, the same way. You pick these pears, they're rock hard, they taste terrible. But after they've been in the cellar for three months, they're really, really good. But these don't work in a commercial setting, so who grows them? Nobody. Rain Tree Nursery. Yes, yes. Been there many a time. It's a good resource. Rain Tree Nursery up in Morton. Um, it's a fun catalog to look through. It's a fun place to go up there. So, yeah, look that one up. Um, what else? Um, I don't know of anybody. I was just thinking through all the garden produce. I don't know of anybody that preserves lettuce. But kale, we're growing a lot of kale this year. That's easy to fix. Yeah? There's a, there's a farm over near Wenatchee called Bluebird Farm. Okay. And they grow wheat and rye that's ancient. Okay. Genetic manipulation. Yes, genetic manipulation. Yeah. I think there's, it's, you know, and that's, okay. That's neat stuff to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and we're about to that point. The uh, things to learn about drying. This dryer uh, is one that we've had for, well, mom used to have it years and years ago. It's a heat controlled so you can do warm or cool for uh, drying different things. Canning, if you don't know how to do canning, it's not that hard to learn. Um, some things like plums are just the easiest, easiest thing to can. Um, this particular batch of plums uh, came from a tree in a vacant lot beside mom's house here in town. And it was, it was loaded. Nobody's picking it. It's just there. And so, so what I did was it's like, wow, look at all those plums. And they're all ripe. They're all really good. So I tucked my shirt in and I climbed up the tree and I just started, I just like that. with, And then I got down, found that, well, I got the boxes first and then just, I filled the, just boxes and boxes of plums. It's free. It was easy. All I just did climb up and pick them. Or if you want a ladder, whatever it is. Cut the tree down. Get the plums. But uh, all you have to do is split them in two, flick the seed out, 
put them in the jar, pour hot, really hot, uh, what we do is we pour hot apple juice. Bunk, right up to there, put the lid on and water bath can it for I think, what, 30 minutes or, or something. I, they're 45 minutes, eh, it's probably 30 minutes. And then boom, it's done. No sugar, just use apple juice and it's really good. We could open it and you could try it. Uh, it's a little more complicated with some of the vegetables. You have to pressure can, like asparagus, tomatoes, uh, need pressure canning. Um, green beans, uh, dry beans, you have to pressure can that. It's, it's, it's simple, it's easy to do. I mean, there's things that you need to know. Another thing that you can do is dry stuff. Really, Family sizes aren't so big nowadays that they need to do fruits and vegetables in these giant two-quart jars, but these make really good jars for dry goods. It keeps the bugs out, and what we have done is we've taken a bag of dried beans and fill it up with the dry beans, put them in the oven at, I don't know, 135 degrees for, I'm trying to think, how long did we do this? 15, 20 minutes. So basically we heated it up and then we took it out of the oven and then put a fresh lid and just screwed it on tight and it sealed. Okay, completely sealed, no bugs in it and it, it can keep a very long time just like that. So you can dry can stuff too. Stuff like this. I mean, really technologically advanced stuff a piece of wood with a nail through it for doing corn. Stick the corn on there so you can cut it off and then can the corn. But country living shouldn't be complicated, right? It's just maybe a few things you'll have to learn how to do, but it's fun to learn how to do. I've got a lot of resources here that you, know, you can look at. Uh, a book on seed saving. Now, seed saving is kind of another issue, and I don't want to just go on and on, um, but it's really good to know how to save your seed, but the big thing to think about is if you've got, let's say you want to see, save your cucumber seeds. Well, if you've got a row that has some lemon cucumbers in it, some straight eight cucumbers, and maybe some pickling cucumbers, those are all gonna cross pollinate. And so whatever you get out of that is gonna be a surprise. Um, so you either have to separate your cucumbers if you wanna save your cucumber seeds, or just plan on having a variety, or planting them at enough distance in time, as it were, that, well, you really can't do that. You can do that with corn. You can't really do that with cucumbers. Corn, you can plant like three weeks apart and you can get a separate pollinating events going on. So you can do that with corn. You can't do that with cucumbers because they just keep going all summer long. Um, then you have to get a little bit more particular. The same thing with squashes. Your squashes and your cucumbers can cross-pollinate. So it's going to... It's going to really make for some interesting stuff. Uh, if you do want to save the seed, you can cheesecloth a couple of uh, male and a couple of female blossoms very loosely so that when they're ready to open up, you can hand pollinate one or two fruits and then close it back up to get your seed. But, you know, that's a lot of energy. If you want to do it, you can. But it's something to think about. If you want to save your seed, just grow one variety of something so you don't have the cross-pollinating issue. And if you pick the seed from the best, strongest plants and keep planting them back in that same spot every year, you are, you're genetically customizing a plant for your particular season in your particular garden. So things do improve for you if you do that. But just kind of number one, keep in mind that cross-pollinating thing and then also 
planting hybrids, you can save the seed from, from a lot of hybrids, but the first, second, third, you're gonna, what's gonna happen is the hybrids are gonna revert back to the parent plants. So you're not gonna get the same sort of thing the next generation. Now again, what's gonna happen is if you have to save seed, like say on a tomato, over the course of six or seven generations, it will eventually go back to the great, great, great grandparent tomatoes that started the whole process that somebody manipulated to do to get this nice big tomato here. So it might be smaller, it might be, but it's going to be stable genetics. And stability is a good thing genetically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she said the company that grew them gave at the end of the season gave them away free if you were in deep in ownership. Yeah. Uh, Baker Creek. I get a lot of my heirloom seeds from Baker Creek over in Missouri. Uh, territorial, just south. Where's Territorial? Down by Albany or Corvallis, somewhere down there. They have. They have some heirloom varieties of seed, but I get most of it from Baker Creek. Um, and I do a lot of heirloom. I do some of both. but uh, And that's pretty much close to the end of my list. Glasses. I don't like wearing them. Uh, but just something I want to leave with you is is find the joy in learning how to do different things than you know how to do right now. Know how to produce something. Uh, like what we're doing is bees. I mean, I really got into that and that was a lot of fun. Uh, the last couple of decades, the price of honey has gone way, way up. So that's becoming a really valuable crop. And if you can do it, well then, you know, it just, it becomes a joy in life to learn, even though you think, well, you know, I'm, I'm tired of learning. I just don't want to. Well, you know what? Kind of put some energy back in your life to relearn, learn some new things. Start a new life. And again, it goes back to Proverbs 27, 12. says what? The prudent man sees trouble coming afar off and hides himself from it. The fool goes on, ah, you know what? I'll deal with it later. Uh, the, 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 there's a fellow up in Squim, uh, produced a video, it's called Back to Eden. He moved to Squim, I, I think back in the 70s. Th he didn't have, the, the big issue was his well produced like less than two gallons a minute. No water, basically. Just enough for household use, but he didn't have enough water to garden in an orchard. And he was, in a, he was really big into agronomy, so he's like, what do I do? What do I do? Well, so he's having morning devotions one morning, and he realizes, you know, right across the street, how can this land support such green, lush growth? just right across the road in the forest. Well, squ was it squim, did I say? It doesn't have that much rainfall, but how can we have so much vegetation? So he walked over there out into the woods and he started noticing there is so much duff on the forest floor that if you just scrape it aside, it's really damp. And this was July or August when he moved up there. And it's like the ground is still damp. But then he goes over into his garden spot and it's bone dry. So he got the idea, you know what, maybe I need to start composting and mulching my garden. So he found where the county was dumping all their tree trimmings that they shredded, you know, from cutting near the power lines. 
And he just started having them bring truckloads after truckloads into his garden spot. And every year he would add another layer of this, this, uh, this mulch that they cut from the trees. And his soil now, he doesn't water it, but yet he can grow this just incredibly lush fruit because he's got so much organic matter in the soil that it just produces incredibly. If you look, look up the video, I think it's Back to Eden. I can't remember the guy's name. Paul, 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 yeah, um, something, can't remember. But he did yeah. He, yeah, he's kind of, he's, he's got his, a bad leg, so he doesn't do much public, uh, public seminars, but it's a really good, interesting video. Uh, so that's something to uh, look for, too. Back to Eden. It's on YouTube, I'm sure it is. Yep. That's an incredible resource. Any other questions? Things I might have missed? Can't think of anything. This is uh, dried pears. A neighbor of ours has two very old pear trees. They're just big. And they, they tell us, come down and get the pears. I think it was five years ago. They had a really good year. We went down and picked pears. We canned off those two trees 105 quarts of pears. We're still using them. And uh, this was probably, um, I think that year we canned them all. This was probably a couple of years ago. And the lid's just screwed on. This doesn't have the, the little sealer thing in there, so bugs could get into this. So it's something we kind of have to watch. But... Yeah, it's kind of light to eat now, but if you want to try some, that's fine. And the same with the apples. This is not a sealed container, but uh, we did these apples with, you know, one of the apple peeler core things, and you can zip through a whole apple in about 30 seconds, just boom, slice it, throw it in the dryer, and it only takes like 12, you know, overnight, and these and they're completely bone dry in one of these dryers. So it's just, it's easy to do. It takes time but it's easy to do. So. Yeah, you can. So I have some interesting books up here that we've collected, some videos that I think are really good. Um, the Resilient Gardener, uh, the gal that wrote this um, is the one that really talks a lot about the, the main staples, the preservable things, beans, corn, Squash and whatever. Now, what about the seal on the uh, devices? Those are nice. Is that magic? Those are nice. You can, yeah, you can suck the air out and then it seals it. And they also have an attachment that you can vacuum jars. So you can vacuum pack, and you know, that would be a really good thing to do with like the dry beans. Just vacuum pack it, put it on the shelf, and it's good. Those are handy. We have one of those. And, matter of fact, there's a trick you can do with the, those seal meals. <laughs> um, we've got a, a, a small one that only takes, like, the bags that are this wide. But we bought the, the, the roll that's, like, that wide. So we could put, like, half a bag of, of wheat. And, and we can make a big bag of this. And what you can do is you can... It's too wide to put in the thing, but if you can... Put the corner and seal the corner. Now the opening is small enough just to fit in. And, and we, can, we can do a great big bag of wheat or rice or something, suck the air out of it, and then seal it as a big bag rather than a whole bunch of these little, <coughs> little things. So there's all kinds of things you can do. to. They tell you you can't do it, but you can reuse these lids. Don't. When you can, don't reef it down really tight, which you're not supposed to do anyway because they buckle. But if you just lightly do them, we've, one year we did not buy any canning lids. We reused them all. Now we had about 10% loss, but, you know, 
usually have a couple percent loss anyway. But the fact is, save those lids. In hard times, you can reuse those. Be careful. Use your thumb and pop them off. Just, And that way you don't get that bent up tab. So just be real careful. And you can pop them off and reuse them. Now, it's not the very, very best thing. It's not 100%, but it's doable. So anyway, that's kind of what I have. So don't feel like you have to stay in a longer. But if you've got any questions or... Um, hmm? Oh, yeah, let me, uh, let me see if I can do that. I had a couple of trailers. One of them is the trailer for this urban danger. And I think another one is a trailer for the sustainable preparedness people. Let me see if I can pull that up. We could have events in the future where the power grid will go down and it's not in any reasonable time coming back on. For instance, if when the power grid went down, uh, some of our large transformers were destroyed, damaged beyond use. Uh, we don't make any of those in this country. They're made overseas and uh, you order one and 18 months to two years later they will deliver it. Uh, our power grid is very vulnerable. It is very much on the edge. Our military knows that. You know one of the things I think of is, is in the event of a disaster what do people do? They flock to the stores. They buy up all their staples and water. So your, your store will be empty faster than it's ever been empty before. When this, when this thing happens to this country, all financial support will be taken away from us. There'll be no financial support. We have to learn how to live without money. And uh, the guy in the country is the one who's gonna do this. A rural area is not a fruitful area for terrorism. The terrorists are going to be looking for the biggest bang for their buck they can get, the highest yield of death. And that's exactly why they mention such things as malls and uh, stadiums and where there are going to be large concentrations of people. So there are a number of events that could create a situation in the cities where civil unrest would be a very high probability. And I think that those who can and those who understand need to take advantage of the opportunity when these winds of strife are not blowing to move their families out. I'll tell you something else about this. It's just plain fun. When you're looking at the challenge of what do I have to do so that I'm independent of the system? We need to get out. A storm is coming, relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? Oh look, beehives. Hi, I'm Edwin, and this is my brother, John, and we want to welcome you to Bountiful Blessings Farm. We really are bountifully blessed to have this farm, our small organic farm here nestled in the, the hills of Middle Tennessee, um, where we farm just under four acres. You see all that pressure there? There's no pumps or anything. That pressure is strictly due to gravity flow. Obviously the holding tank is above the level of our garden area here, and so the nice pressure you see there is due to the difference in height. Uh, this is our fuel for heating and also for cooking. Yes. These solar panels are collecting energy from the sun and sending that DC electricity down through this combiner box where all the wires from these solar panels are combined, and then it sends it into our cabin, into the power room, where it charges our batteries. Let's go inside and see what our alternative energy system looks like. Okay, we're gonna put the last jar in the bottom. We're gonna put this on so that we can put the next row on top, and we only have one more jar. Alrighty, this is our woodshed, and as you can see, we've got our winter supply of wood in. 
and uh, we had some friends and neighbors help us get our wood in, but we did a lot of this ourselves, and um, it was a new experience for us. We had never used a chainsaw before, but we learned how, and this is the result, the fruit of our labor. So obviously that was just a trailer of the uh, Urban Danger film. And then I've got another one here. This was, okay, see this is the picture of the, the cabin in the mountains. It looks nice, doesn't it? And it'd be a fun place to go live for a while, but this wouldn't be a, this is not country living. First of all, you're too close to the lake if the water comes up. I mean, there's just, there's no place for garden. It's rocky soil, but it's a neat picture, so they used it. We often speak of helping others and being a witness for Jesus in the tumultuous days ahead. But do we actually consider what it would take physically? Would you even be able to take care of your family's most basic necessities of life, let alone be in a position to help others? Could you provide water, food, and heat if the utilities were down? And how about when you can't buy or sell? Jesus ministered to people through the practical aspects of life and was therefore able to minister to them spiritually. Will you be in a position to do this? How will you minister to starving people with a bowl of soup if you're standing in the soup lines yourself? God wants us to be the head and not the tail. He wants us to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. The time has come to act decisively. It's patriotic to be as little dependent on the system as you can because then in an emergency you're not going to be a liability, you'll be an asset. And if you're planning for a future, you ought to plan for a future where you're going to, uh, to the extent you can, share uh, your, your good fortune uh, with, with someone else. So it's a patriotic thing to do, and certainly in terms of your club or your church, uh, where you have a circle of friends that you would like to, uh, to make sure are, are, are secure and, uh, and, and safe, and your family. So at whatever level you're concentrating on, being as self-sufficient as you can, uh, as quickly as you can, is going to be the right thing to do. In our Sustainable Preparedness Seminars, you'll learn a wealth of information to help you make a wise and successful transition, the kind of information we wish we had when we made our move. You'll learn about renewable energy systems, how to make your own electricity without being connected to power utilities, how to have your own year-round grocery store at home and stop depending on the giant food conglomerates to do your preparing for you, Weekend seminars also include a live canning and bread making demo. How to set up a water system that would supply your family even if the utilities were down. What to look for in making a regular home an independent homestead. Suggestions for making a living in rural locations. Valuable instruction on how to heat your home independently with wood and what you can do right now, wherever you are, to live a more prepared lifestyle and be in a position to help those around you so you can be part of the solution 
rather than part of the problem. Another website, the, that, last, that last preview was the sustainable preparedness. The first one was the urban danger, and you noticed, you could tell who produced that, huh? Because it was a lot of the same clips. The same people produced this. The, actually, urban dangers was produced by the Meisners and um, the family that does Country Living University, and that's another really good website. Uh, they've got a kind of a whole package program that you can go through, and it just goes through every facet of looking for, buying, preparing, and setting up a country lifestyle. Um, they they just, just go through the whole thing, and a lot of education there. But the, the Westbrooks that do that, I think got together with the, the Meisners to produce the urban danger. But uh, another interesting video to watch, I don't know, interesting might be a wrong word, but there was uh, the History Channel did a, a uh, it's a series on YouTube, but I think it was called something about After Armageddon. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit hyped up and it has a lot of gloom and doom in it. But for me, it's like, it was entertaining. Because you can kind of see where people are thinking. And, you know, human personality, human, humans are predictable. Um, so, you know, you can kind of learn some things about what crazy can look like. But anyway, I... Don't necessarily recommend that. It's it's interesting, but it's not educational like some of these things are. And again, go go home and look up the testing time by, Har by Paul Harvey. If you want to look at this and get some information, that is just a really good book that I think it will encourage you in this whole country living thing. But if you want to come up and look at the books, that's fine. So, uh, so what we have. Thank you for coming. <laughs>